All right, well, we come together this morning to worship in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I was uh, thinking this week uh, about how grateful I am for the opportunities that we have been given. You know, it's been a, we are, believe it or not, we are approaching uh, the one year mark. Uh, Jennifer and I were looking at, uh, Facebook is really good for us because it pops up uh, memories. Here's, uh, those of you who are on Facebook, you get that. Pops up a memory, says, you know, a year ago on this day. And a year ago here and a week or so, uh, we were in St. Louis. Uh, my cousin was getting married. It's the last travel I got to make. And I realized that we came back from that and we had about a month and a half. And all of a sudden, it was March and everything changed. And yet God has been so faithful to us as a community that we have been able to continue to do our stuff. Yeah, we did a few months online, but we had the, we had the ability to do that. And we had some great engagement and conversation. And then uh, the Kellys were, uh, gave us a place to celebrate. We had great weather this summer that allowed us to worship up at Windy Hills all the way through the month of September. And the school then said, hey, you can come back and we can use the place and we can made it all the way through Christmas. And uh, I've been so grateful for the opportunities that God has given us to be together, uh, to worship together, as he has protected our community and allowed us just to be uh, in this place, to come together, whether it's whether it's in this room or whether it's people who join us online. We get a significant number of our congregation joining us online as well. He has given us the ability. And I hope that we are all grateful for this because God has worked through the midst of this. There is no point in our lives where God says, oh, I'm not, I'm not going to be, I'm not going to be there. You guys are on your own. But instead, if we look for it, if we watch for it, we see God working, we see him moving, we see him uh, blessing us and continuing to do amazing things in our midst. There is no situation that he doesn't work in. In fact, it's the ones that are the most challenging where I think God shows up the most visibly. Have you ever noticed that? When things are clicking along real good, we have a tendency to go, hey, you know, I got this. I'm doing really well. But when things get difficult, when things spiral out of our control, we look for help. And those are the moments where we see God most clearly. He wants us to be absolutely dependent. We're going to talk about that some more today as we continue talking about holiness. But he wants us to be absolutely dependent on him. Will you join me as we pray this morning? Gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we come in this place. And we give thanks, Lord, that you are present in our midst. We pray, Lord, that you would fill this room with your Holy Spirit. That you would remind us that you walk with us each and every step of each and every day, Lord. That there is no situation we face that you are not present with us. Or as the psalmist writes, on the highest mountain, you're there with us. In the deepest valley, you're down there with us. We are not alone, but you are present. Lord, we recognize that we are sinners saved only by your grace. That without you, without the presence of your Holy Spirit, we would walk lost in our sins. But instead, Lord, you have come yourself to make a way. At Christmas, you sent Jesus, your presence, God with us, in our midst to live among us. On Good Friday, you sent Jesus to that cross in our place so that we could have forgiveness for our sins. And so we come this morning, Lord, recognizing that we are sinful people, but instead of feeling hopeless, Lord, we come and we offer up to you repentance for our sins. We pray, Lord, that you would forgive us, that you would wash us clean by the blood of Jesus, that you would make us, once again, a new creation, that you would fix what's broken, that you would draw us back to you, Lord. We are sorry for our sins. But we thank you, Lord, for the forgiveness that you offer to us, that you give to us, that a repentant heart receives new life. And so this morning as we worship, Lord, we pray that you would fill us with your presence. Wherever we are in this room, whether we're gathering online, Lord, we just pray that you are with us this morning. It's in Jesus' name we pray and all God's children said, amen. With that, I would invite you to join us this morning as we celebrate Jesus in our midst.
lost, but he brought me in. Oh, his love for me. Oh, his love for me. Who oh, the sun sets free. Oh, his indeed. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. Ransom me, oh, his grace runs deep. While I was a slave to sin, Jesus died for me. Yes, he died for me. Who the Son sets free, oh, is great privileges that we have as children of God is to come and to receive from him the gift of the of the table we come this morning to receive God's presence in the bread and in the and in the wine uh, Jesus has made several promises to us first he invites us to come and to remember his sacrifice he invites us to come and remember what he did for us. The fact that he stood in the place that we could not stand. That he paid the price that we owed. It's not a, it's not a debt that God himself owed, but it's one only God could satisfy. And so he did what he didn't have to do. I think that's one of the most important things that, that we should remember. God didn't have to do for us what he did. And this shows God's love for us, that he came and did for us what we couldn't do for ourselves is he went to the cross in our place as he gave his life in our place because he loves us and because he cares for us. And this is, this is a remembrance of that. It reminds us that God loves us, each and every one of us. We also come and receive his true presence as Jesus has promised to meet us here in this meal. Christ is truly present with his words. He says, this is my body. This is my blood. We don't understand how he does that, but you know what? He's God. He can do what he wants. He can work outside of what we can understand. His ways are not our ways, but we take on, fa on faith the fact that Christ is right here with us through the power of the Holy Spirit. This is the body of Christ, and this is the blood of Christ. And we come also this morning 
to make that declaration of our faith. Eating and drinking is a proclamation of the gospel. We declare we believe in Jesus when we eat and drink. And so this morning, I invite you to come and to share in this amazing meal that can do so much more than eating just a little bit of bread, drinking just a little bit of wine or juice but can do so much more in our lives. On the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread and he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples to eat, saying, take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And again, after supper, he took the cup. And after he had blessed it, he gave it to them to drink, saying, drink of it, all of you. This cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for you for the forgiveness of all of your sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. I love those words. This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you for what? The forgiveness of not just some, not just the things that you remember, not just the ones you're really embarrassed by, but for all of your sins, no matter what you have done in your life, there is forgiveness in this meal. And so what I would invite you to come this morning to receive from Jesus what you cannot do for yourself, forgiveness for your sins. this morning the true body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen and preserve you to everlasting life your sins are forgiven in his name amen this time I would invite you to join us as we pray this is one of the great opportunities that we have to bring our prayers and our petitions before God as we come to pray for uh, our needs in our lives the needs of our family and friends our neighbors uh, maybe just somebody that we happen to meet on the street that we feel could use a little extra help maybe just needs to feel the touch of God's presence. And so we come this morning, lift up our prayers. If you will join me as we pray this morning. Gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, first we are so thankful for the great gift of your table that you have given us. Lord, as we came and we ate and we drank this morning and we received your true presence, as we received that forgiveness for our sins, that, that tangible gift, Lord, that helps us to realize and understand the life that you gave was for us and on our behalf. And because of that, when we come with repentant heart, Lord, you forgive us for our sins. And so we are so thankful to have received that this morning. We also come this morning, Lord, to lift up the prayers and petitions that we have in our lives, in the lives of our family and friends and our neighbors, in our nation and in our world. Lord, we recognize that we live in a broken world. If our world did not experience the impact of sin, Lord, we wouldn't need to come and to lift up our petitions to you because we would have none. But Lord, we recognize the brokenness and the hurt that we see all around us as people struggle, as people experience pain and suffering. Lord, we've gone through uh, not just a couple of weeks, but months, Lord, of, of division and battle and and strife and struggle in our country in very visible ways, Lord. And we pray, God, for your presence. We pray for your Holy Spirit to sweep across our nation, Lord. We pray for your love in the midst of pain and suffering, Lord. We pray for your presence to come. We pray, Lord, that, uh, that all of those who would seek to harm others, Lord, would instead be overcome by your peace. That they would see those that they view as enemies, Lord, and as instead how you view them, Lord, as loved creations that you have lovingly crafted. Lord, help us to recognize the fact that within each and every one of us that we were all created in your image, Lord, that your fingerprints are on our lives. Lord, bring, bring peace in the midst of disharmony. Lord, we face rocky roads ahead, and we pray this morning, Lord, for the president of our nation. We pray for uh, all the members of his staff as they get ready to move on to the next phase of their lives. We pray also, Lord, for the incoming leadership as well. We pray that you would bless each and every one of them, that 
They would recognize that the authority that they wield comes from you, Lord, and they would use wisdom that you grant them to govern well. Lord, we pray for our leaders here in the state of Washington. Lord, we pray for our leadership in Clark County and in Ridgefield. We pray, Lord, that your hand would be upon each and every one of them. Lord, we also come this morning lifting up to you all of those who are struggling under the burden of sickness and illness and disease, Lord. We pray, Lord, for your hand upon all of those who are, uh, who are sick in any way, Lord. For those experiencing the effects of COVID, Lord, we pray for your healing hand. For those who have lost loved ones, we pray for your comfort and peace. Lord, we pray that you would just wipe it away, that we would be able to uh, once again enter into some semblance of normality in our lives, Lord. Help us to also find peace. Lord, we also pray that you would help us to see your work in the midst of our struggles. Be with us. We lift up to you, Lord, all of those who are continuing to struggle with illness and disease, Lord. We pray for uh, Debbie Mers, the elementary secretary in Kalama who is now on hospice, Lord. We pray for peace for her family. We pray for comfort as they are losing a grandmother and a mother small community is losing a significant member of their community. Lord, we pray for your peace and your comfort. Help all of those to remember, Lord, that when you call us home, death is not the end. We pray, Lord, also for Ray Helbush, who is struggling right now with COVID. We pray for your healing hand upon him, O oh Lord. We pray for Will Nevin, Bob and Dee Lenhart, Judy Weber, Roger Weber's brother, the Kelly family who are traveling. We lift up to you comfort for Sharon Swanson and the family of Greg Hendricks, Jeff Morris, Virgil Walter. Pray for those battling cancer. Roberta, Ellen Roloffs, John Lamison, Vanessa Becker, Dave Penk, Verlin Larson, Debbie Fold. Pray for your healing on Fawn Glover, for Rodrigo's mother, for Aleja's mother, Jackie, for Roger Turnbull's father, Vicki Epperson, Margie Goldsby. Lord, for all of these needs, you know each and every circumstance and each and every need, Lord, and we pray that your hand would be upon them. Bring healing where healing is needed, Lord. Bring peace and comfort where peace and comfort are desperately desired, Lord. And in all circumstances, remind us of your presence. We pray all of this in the name of the one who taught us to pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. This time I announce our offering. The offerings we take go to support the ministries of Christ's community as is our practice. Uh, the red box at the entrance, you can put your, uh, your offering in there, online at ccridgefield.com, in the church app, or mail it to the office at our P.O. box. And we continue this morning by just taking a few moments to reflect on how God has blessed us in our lives, and how he is calling us to give back out of the great blessings that he has poured out upon us.
last week, we started a new series titled Holy. And we began talking about living holy in an unholy world. And last week, we kind of laid the foundation about this, right? We talked about what holiness means. It's this, this process of becoming more like Christ. It's this process of being made into the image of Christ. I think most importantly, it's a process. But last week, what we talked about was we talked about holy being a four-letter word, which on its, on its surface, it's, that's correct, right? It's spelled H-O-L-Y. That's four letters. But also all of kind of the negative implications that a four-letter word has because holiness makes us nervous. We, we struggle with the fact that it seems like an impossible task. And it's really not something that we like to talk about all that often in church. I mean, periodically we'll mention it, right? We'll talk about sanctification. We'll talk about holiness. We'll talk about this, this, this journey, this process. Maybe sometimes it gives us an excuse to say, well, I'm just on the journey. I'm not there yet. But holiness is something that we look at so often and we go, I just don't know how to get there. I don't know how to do it. God says in his word, he says, uh, I'm holy, so I want you to be holy. And, and we say, okay, well, God said it, so he must want it. But I know myself, right? And I, I fall apart, and I just don't do things well. And so we make it into something we don't like to talk about or to acknowledge or even pretend exists. The thing about holiness is it would be a heck of a lot easier if we remembered that not only does God call us to be holy, but he wants, it to, he wants us to leave it in his hands. He wants us to leave it up to him. Holiness is less about what we can do and is more about what God wants to do in us. If we let him. If we let him. This is really our only part in the process of holiness. If we wrap our minds around that, if we can get away from the, this is what I have to do, and instead wrap our minds around the fact that God wants to do this work in us, if we will let him do it, holiness becomes a lot more approachable and a lot more attainable. I wanted to mention this morning, last week I mentioned a book titled Holy is a Four-Letter Word. This is a copy of it. If you're interested in taking a look at it afterwards, I'd invite you to do so. This is pretty good. A guy by the name of Charles C. Lake and Matthew Ayers uh, wrote this book, and uh, it's How to Live a Holy Life in an Unholy World. Now, if you're looking at that, you're going, man, that sounds a lot like the title of this book. Yes, there is a lot of information that is helping to bolster what we're talking about over the next few weeks, because I think it's really beneficial for us to focus a lot more of our lives on holiness. And really, that part of this whole process that is about leaving it to God, because this is, uh, this is what we're talking about today. Dying to ourselves is letting God do the work, giving up on who we are. I came in this morning taking a whole bunch of selfies, because I think this is where our culture often is. And even if this isn't something that you maybe participate in so much, it's something that you certainly have seen, I have plenty of pictures of myself on my social media feeds. We are, in a lot of ways, we become kind of a selfie-obsessed culture. And this is not simply because we all have a camera in our pockets. We were a selfie-obsessed culture before a selfie was a thing. And this morning, what I want to talk about is dying to our selfie. Or dying to ourselves. Because dying to ourselves, it's surrendering my will to God's. It's turning my will over to him. To become like Jesus, which is the process of holiness, it means letting go. And I think I can speak pretty confidently for most of us. We're not good at letting go. We're not good at letting go and letting God do his thing. When we think about holiness... A lot of times, we think that that talks about our actions. You know, maybe if I am just more holy in how I act. But holiness is really a lot more about becoming like Jesus, not so much in our actions, but in our hearts and our minds. Becoming like Jesus in how we think 
and in how we love and how we seek out God. It's not that actions aren't important. In fact, actions are incredibly important. But they're not the starting place of holiness. There are a lot of people out there who do good things. We might even call them Christ-like, and our actions are a barometer of our heart. James writes in James chapter 2, he says, But someone will say, You have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds. James says, I will show you my faith by my deeds. Now, what's James saying there? James is saying that our actions are important. They are a measure of our faith. It is impossible to live a life for Christ and to not then act like Christ. But actions are also deceptive. Because while they can speak to our condition of heart, it is possible, and honestly very common, for our actions to hide our hearts as well. Becoming like Jesus, though, in our hearts and in our minds and how we seek God's will is entirely about our heart. The problem that I have, it's the me of me that stops me from allowing God to do what he wants to do in my life. It's, it's you and it's me that puts a lid on God's spiritual work. You ever notice that? Right? We don't have a lot of involvement in the holiness. I, maybe that's not the best way to say that. There is not not a lot that we do when it comes to the process of holiness. It's all God's work in us. But we are really good at not allowing God into our lives. We can put a lid on God. We can limit what God wants to do. We can stunt our spiritual growth because we are focused on the me rather than he. Did you catch what I did there? Isn't that smooth? Right? Focused on me rather than, okay. All right, we'll move on from that. This plays out, though, in our Christian life when things largely resolve around, uh, revolve around us. Uh, and this is one of the places we get to so often, right? What's God going to do for me? How is God going to fill my need? How is God going to take care of my problem? How is God going to fix my family? How is God going to improve my job? How is he going to take care of me? We become very selfie-focused. What God is calling us to do is focus on being like him, not on being like ourselves. Rather than being self-reliant, because when we're self-reliant, we're not trusting God. Rather than being self-reliant, what God wants to do is have us focus on what we can give or what he's calling us to give in our lives. Let me explain that just a little bit more. We get focused on what we can do rather than what God's calling us to do. I have a great example of this, and it always goes back to my own life because sometimes my life, I think, is, uh, is exactly what God is telling us not to do when it comes to getting there. So I am going to come and I am going to be vulnerable before you and tell you what not to do. All right? In 2001... I recognized a call from God to be a pastor. It's 20 years ago now, I'm doing the math, and that scares me just a little bit. And my answer to that was no. Because I recognized the impossibility of it. I was focused on what I could do. And I knew beyond a shadow of a doubt there was no way that I could do that. A few years later, I was more mature in my faith. And once again, I realized God was calling me to be a pastor. And my response this time was a much more emphatic no. Because now I knew what he was calling me to do, and I knew that I couldn't do it. See, before I was in this place of unconscious incompetence. I didn't know what I didn't know. Now I knew exactly what I didn't know, and it terrified me even more. What I didn't know, though was that God had already worked out the process of transformation that he was planning to do in my life. He had already worked out the process of transformation that would make possible for me to do what I knew I couldn't do. Do you see how that works? If I was willing to stop and let God 
work out his process in my life, there wasn't anything that was going to stand in the way. We get caught up in what we can do, and we forget what God wants to do. And this is where we get into trouble. This is where I got into trouble. God wasn't telling me what I realize now, 20 years after the fact, is God wasn't saying, hey, I want you to start tomorrow pastoring a church, preaching from the pulpit. If I ever mention the fact that I don't like public speaking, people scare me. God wasn't saying, I want you to step into that spot. He can make that possible, but he had a process of transformation that was in place. It was going to take me from that moment, it was going to take me another 12 years to get through the process. I didn't see that part. I just knew that I couldn't do it. Holiness, though, is about dying to the people that we are so that we can be made new in God's image. Until we deal with the very root of our rebelliousness to God, our self-will... Until we deal with that, we're never going to be truly his. The illustration I started with this morning is our cell phones. I think everybody in here probably has one. I want to clarify first, this is not a cell phone. This is a miniature computerized device that has a a phone app on it. Okay? Right? In fact... uh, I don't know about you, I don't use my phone like this very often. I use my phone like this. It's my phone like this. I use my phone like this. And if I actually want to make a phone call, usually often I pull these out and stick them in my ear. Very, uh, very rarely do I have my phone like this. But our cell phones are a great example of this dying to self that we need to do. We've become this selfie culture. We have, an, we have entire social media platforms that are devoted to this selfie obsession. Instagram, TikTok, Tumblr, how we use our camera shows where our focus lies. Now, this is a general we, you know. Maybe it doesn't apply to you necessarily. Maybe you're one of those people who this is how you use your phone. But... In general, I think this is what we see a lot of times. This is a visible evidence of the barrier that stands between us and holiness. And this focus on self is going to lead to some really practical problems. Because when I'm focused on me, I'm always going to be frustrated and angry and dissatisfied. I'm going to be stunted I'm not going to get to where God wants me to go. If if God hadn't been persistent and worn me down and gotten me to say, okay, God, I'm willing to let you lead, I wouldn't be where he wants me to be. I would be frustrated and dissatisfied. I I get frustrated and dissatisfied for whole other reasons now because I'm still me-focused. You know, now that I get to this point, I'm like, well, how am I going to do that? And then I forget and remember once again and go, oh, right, it's not me who's going to get there. But we'll be angry and frustrated and dissatisfied because we are built to be other-focused. We are not built to be focused on ourselves. We're built to be focused on others. We are created to have our focus on someone other than ourselves. As long as we're focused on ourselves, we will always be weak followers of Christ. If the focus of our faith is self-centered, we aren't going to experience real transformation. We aren't going to experience the amazing life that comes from walking in faith. Where we get into trouble is maybe we hear the call of God, but then we go about seeing how we can make it happen. And this is a serious problem because it sets us up so there's this battle going on between our self-will and God. And I don't know if you've ever noticed, fighting with God is a losing proposition. He's either going to let you have exactly what you want, which is never a good thing. A good example of this is uh, King Saul and the nation of Israel. They said, we want a king. God said, I have other plans. They said, no, we want a king. And so God gave them a king, exactly what they were looking for. It was a terrible time in their history. So he's either going to give you what you think you want, or worse yet, he's going to make his will happen in your life. And has anybody ever been here, when God, been through it, when God makes his will happen in your life while you are saying, I don't want to do it? Okay? That process of breaking is painful. 
I've been there through that too. I've experienced that in my life where I've said no and God says, "Uh uh-huh, it's going to happen. And I lose and it hurts. It's very humbling, by the way. Paul gives testimony to this though. This this learning to die to ourselves. In Galatians chapter 2, he says this, and I love his words here. He says, my old self has been. So past tense. It's already happened. It's not something he's looking for. It's something that has happened. My old self has been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. So I live in this earthly body by trusting in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. What's Paul saying when he says he's been crucified? I mean, Paul's clearly walking around. He's not, he's not a zombie, right? He's not like, oh, I'm dead, but I'm alive sort of thing. Paul is still very much alive. So what's he mean when he says he's been crucified? It's not his physical life. It's his self. It's his, uh, it's his determination to do things his own way. He has given himself over to God completely. The person that he was has been crucified, and now Christ lives in him. See, Paul has cracked the code. You remember our memory verse from last week? No? Leviticus chapter 11, verse 45. Let's try this again. Leviticus 11, 45. See if we can remember this. Read it with me. I am the Lord who brought you up out of Egypt to be your God. Therefore, be holy because I am holy. Paul has figured it out. He isn't put off by this direction to be holy because God is holy. He doesn't look at it with panic and go, this is impossible. What he recognizes is that it comes when he allows God to crucify the person that he was and allows Christ to live within him, when he stops saying no to God's control over his life and instead lives entirely, surrenders his will to God. Paul has discovered the key being to being holy is to allow Christ to live in him. He experiences death. It's a spiritual death, but it's still death. The person he was, the person who is selfie-obsessed, focused, dies, and it's replaced by the Holy Spirit. Remember, we call him the Holy Spirit who comes to live within us. We turn our lives over to Christ. This is the start of holiness in us. We take our cameras and we hit the flip button. You ever notice that on your camera? Right? You know, you're on the selfie side, but you hit this little thing with the arrows and it goes the other way. That's pretty cool, right? It's how you get looking from looking at yourself, from the focus being on yourself, on someone else. See, you didn't realize your camera phone was going to be such a great spiritual example. You can tell someone this. This is how you die to yourself and live for Christ. You hit the little flip button, right? You get away from the focus on yourself and you belong to Jesus. For our hearts to be his, we have to put to death our selfie mentality. I'm no longer the boss of my life. And I guarantee you that surrendering your will is probably going to be the hardest thing you ever have to do because we don't like to let it go. And it's not going to be perfect. We're going to constantly try to take it back. We're going to constantly grab hold of the wheel. This is why holiness is a process that's going to last our entire lives. It doesn't happen, and then you're done. Because we keep trying to grab back, control the direction we're going. Romans chapter 7, Paul writes, I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate, I do. And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. As it is, it is no longer I myself who do it, but the sin living in me. For I know that good itself does not dwell in me, that it is in my sinful nature. That is, in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do, that I keep on doing. Now, if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but the sin living in me that does it. That's a lot of words, isn't it? As I was reading through that, I'm like, man, am I reading a Dr. Seuss book here? 
But the general gist of this is, Paul's saying, here's Paul who has it figured out. He's figured out that he needs to die to himself and live for Christ, and yet he's still saying, look, the things I want to do, I'm not doing. And the things I don't want to do, those are the things I'm doing. Holiness is a process in our lives, and it's not going to happen overnight. And we're going to continue to wrestle with it, and we're going to continue to grow. But this is the process of maturity, maturing in our faith, growing in Christ. None of us went from being born to being full-grown. None of us went from being immature to being mature without it taking time in our lives. What Paul's saying here is mistakes are going to happen. We're going to mess up. Even though we know better, we're going to mess up. But knowing where it comes from, recognizing the influence of sin that still lives within us, now we know what we've got to do. Jesus helps us to live a holy life, but only if we let him. I, I, here's a great quote from Mother Teresa. She says, one cannot love God except at the expense of oneself. Think about that for a moment. You cannot love God unless you give up yourself. Matthew chapter 16, Jesus is speaking to his disciples and he puts it this way. This is from Eugene Peterson's version, the message. But he says, then Jesus went to work on his disciples and he says, anyone who intends to come with me has to let me leave. You're not in the driver's seat. I'm in the driver's seat. You got to let Jesus be in charge. So what's this going to look like? What does it look like to surrender my me-focused life and allow God to work holiness in me? Let me put it this way. It's putting to, get to death our self-ish life and instead embracing a selfless life. A selfless life is other-focused. A selfish life is me-focused. Matthew chapter 22 his disciples ask him, he says, Teacher, which is the greatest commandment of the law? And Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and the greatest commandment. Love God. The second is like it. So it's second, but it's also like the first. Jesus puts equal importance on these. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law, all the prophets, hang on these two commandments. There is no me focus in that. The greatest commandment says love God and love others. There is no selfie in that. The camera has to be flipped the other way. There is no greater example of giving it all for the sake of another than, than Jesus dying on the cross. We celebrated that today when we came and we shared in the table the bread and in the wine. We talked about Jesus' death on the cross. There is no greater example of giving it all for someone else than Jesus' death on the cross. He gives us the command then in Matthew to love God and love each other, and his neighbor doesn't have qualifiers. He did not die on the cross for some people. He died on the cross for all people, and the only thing, that, uh, requ the only thing required to receive the gift of that death is to not be me-focused. It's to call on Jesus to accept his lordship in our lives, and we receive the gift of God's grace. If we're going to be like Jesus, if we're going to be made holy as God wants to make us holy, we need to see people also and, uh, and love people and serve people as Jesus does. Jesus doesn't limit the neighbor to the ones who are easy to like or easy to love. In fact, here's my challenge for you. Whether you're here in this room, I see you, or you're joining us online, I want you right now, think of two people that are hard for you to love. Think of two people that are impossible for you to love, that you know in your heart you dislike, and I want you to commit over the next week to loving them. I'll make this easy. You don't have to talk to them. But I would encourage you over the next week. Some of you are laughing because you just had people pop into your mind, didn't you? Yeah. I would encourage you over the next week to pray for those people. Every single day, pray for them. And don't pray, God, I wish you would make them better people. That's a given, right? But instead, pray God's blessings on them. Pray God's grace on them. Commit for the next week to love them and pray for them every day. Or better yet, 
every time Jesus brings it into your mind. Not just like, oh, I have it on my list to pray for in the morning, but you're, you're doing something, and for some reason their name pops into your mind, and you go, ooh. And now you pray for them as well. So we're called as followers of Christ to take that selfie camera off ourselves and to shine the light of Jesus into the lives of other people. Our greatest mission is to love God and to love others, and that requires that we have to surrender the me focus. So here's another challenge. Check this out. So you know that your camera or your phone has a camera. How many of you have a flashlight on your phone that you know that? Right? You can turn the flashlight on. Okay? Now, did you know that you cannot shine light and take a picture at the same time? You cannot shine the light and turn the focus on to me. The camera comes on and the light goes out. Here's another cell phone example. You cannot shine the light of Jesus when the focus is on yourself. I'm disappointed. I was kind of hoping you all would pull that out and see if it really worked. (laughs) You cannot shine the light of Jesus and keep the focus on yourself. You got to turn the camera around. My light is shining. If my light is shining, the Jesus light is not. My light shining, Jesus is not being shown. We need to die to ourselves. Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, just before his physical crucifixion, he shows us how to have a spiritual one. This is a passage that has a parallel in all four Gospels, but in Matthew chapter 26, Jesus has gone into the Garden to pray. And he's left his disciples, and he's gone off on his own. And he says to God, falls on his face, And he says, my father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. Father, if it's possible, I do not want to go to that cross. But what's he say? Yet not as I will, but as you will. Jesus, in the preparation for his physical death, shows us how to be crucified with him in our spiritual lives. How to give up the me to focus on he. To surrender who we are to God's will. If it's, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me, yet not as I will, O Lord, but as you will. Jesus didn't want to die. As far as it was in his will, he would just as soon have let God's cup of wrath pass him by. This is human nature. We'd just as soon not suffer. But Jesus shows that he is Jesus. He says, not as I will, O Lord, but as you will. Can we take the selfie light off of ourselves and submit entirely to Jesus? This is how we die to ourselves. This is how we die to who we are and instead live entirely for Christ. We will continue to try and live for ourselves as dying isn't a once for all. I mentioned that we're going to continually try to grab a hold of the steering wheel and take back control of our lives. That sinful nature is going to constantly rear its head. It's going to constantly be poking up there. We're going to be constantly trying to flip the camera back on ourselves. Paul said it in the Romans verse. The things I want to do, those are the things I don't do. The things I know are what God calls me to do. The things I hate, the things I know are the result of my old life, the old person. Those are the things I keep persisting in. But it's not hopeless. Paul's not saying it's hopeless. He's saying every day is a process of surrender. Every day, we commit ourselves through faith. Every day, we turn our lives back over to Jesus. Every day, we give back control of our lives. Every single day, we commit ourselves and we say, I believe. We're baptized in the waters. We're washed clean of who we are. We become part of his family. That can't be taken away. But we continually die to ourselves each day as we grow in holiness. We're going to look at this more in the weeks ahead. Today, though, if you get anything from this, I hope it's this. Our selfies get in the way of his presence. When we realize that, we can begin to live for Christ. Become the people he wants to be. Grow in holiness as he wants to grow us in holiness. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, I give thanks that you are the one who is making this process possible. If it were left up to any of us, Lord, we, would, we wouldn't even know how to begin, let alone carry it through to completion, Lord. 
as we live our lives, Lord, help us to give up our selfies and instead, Lord, allow you to make us the people that you want us to be. Fill us with your presence, O oh God. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. With that, I would invite you to stand, and we'll share the blessing this morning before we get ready to head out here. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and grant you his peace. Amen. Thanks, baby.
ready to go out this morning, just remember, two people, two people, pray for them this week, each day. Go in peace, serve the Lord.